This is De Garis Essays, that is two, three page opinion pieces on topics such as species dominance, the global state, politics, femtotech, religion, society and education. Written by and read aloud by Prof. Dr. Hugo de Garris. This is essay number 3131 entitled Greater Male Variance in brackets GMV and its consequences by Prof. Dr. Hugo de Garris. Email profhugodegarris at yahoo.com. Website profhugodegarris.wordpress.com. Abstract. Make it a bit bigger. Abstract. Any sexually dimorphic species, that is, where the males and females have different bodies, from insects to humans, will manifest the phenomenon of greater male variance. That is, the statistical variance of some biologically measurable quantity will be greater for the males. In the case of human IQ scores, the male variance is about 10% larger than for females. The moment one becomes conscious of this very general biological phenomenon, one is forced to admit that human morons and human genii are males. The greater the z-score, that is, the number of standard deviations from the mean, the higher is the proportion of males scoring that z. Since GMV is genetically determined, see below, the feminists will simply have to accept the fact that the genii of the planet are males. They can do nothing about it, so should stop making wild, ignorant claims to the contrary. They're just showing their scientific ignorance. In other words, there is science. And will be discredited as awareness of the GMV phenomenon spreads. The last part of this essay shows that the predicted proportion of females to males at various high IQ levels matches fairly closely those of the real world. Hence, GMV is a good quantitative theory to explain the genetically determined existence of the patriarchy, that is, rule by, by males. 1. Introduction. A few years ago, the president of Harvard University expressed his opinion in a public speech that perhaps the reason why women are so underrepresented in the sciences and engineering at full professorial level in an Ivy League university like Harvard was that women's abilities in these subjects were inferior to men's. Feminist professors in his school went livid and the president later apologized. In fact, he's fired. This reaction by the feminist professors and the subsequent apology both disappointed and annoyed me. On both counts, the feminists and the president were showing their ignorance of a basic biological law of GMV, greater male variance, which I now state. Definition of GMV. Any sexually dimorphic species, that is where the bodies of the males differ from the females, will manifest the phenomenon of greater male variance. That is, the statistical variance of some measurable quantity will be greater with the males than the females over the population of that species. This is a widespread phenomenon in the biological world, ranging from insects through mammals to humans. In the case of human measurable intelligence, for example on IQ tests, the IQ score variance is about 10% higher for males. So the IQ probability distribution, or bell curve, for males is shorter and fatter than for females. Since the variance difference is only 10%, this means that since the IQ tests are devised so as to give males and females an equal average mean score, male and female IQs will overlap for the vast majority of the population. Now, ad libbing, uh, more recently, Professor Rushton, who died a couple of years back, a uh, famous figure, a uh, psychometrician. He studied about 50,000 SAT, student aptitude tests, their uh, entrance exams for university in America. For uh, 50,000 for males and 50,000 for females, and came to the conclusion that the average IQ of males was about three or four IQ points higher than for females. Okay. Uh, back to the essay. This has as, as a consequence that the feminists may justifiably claim that women are just as capable, just as smart as men, 
and this reality should not be ignored by ignorant social customs. Women should be given equal opportunities since their abilities are equal, generally speaking. Well, given what I said about Professor Rushton, uh, the IQ bell curve for women has shifted down a bit. Also, it's taller and thinner than the male bell curve. So the morons and the genii males. Okay, back, back to the essay. Two, consequences of GMV. However, let us not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let us look at the claim of the president of Harvard University. He was actually correct. If he had been better informed, he could have reprimanded his feminist colleagues, accusing them of ignorance of the phenomenon of GMV. If the feminists had also known about GMV, they would have shut up and ex accepted what the president said as a fact, a biologically well-supported fact. Hopefully in the future such incidents will disappear as people become better informed about the GMV phenomenon. Why was the president correct? <coughs> One can take the male and female IQ variance scores and plug them into the Bell, that is the Gaussian, curve formula to calculate the proportion of men and women at a given Z score, that is the number of standard deviations from the average score. If you don't know any statistics, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance, which is defined to be the average of the square of the differences of the population scores from the average. That is, the standard deviation is a root mean square of the deviations from the average score. If you haven't a clue what I'm talking about, well, don't read this essay. You're just an enumerate peasant. The variance is a measure of the fatness or spread outness of the bell curve. Since the variance of males is greater, the male bell curve is shorter and fatter, and the female bell curve is taller and thinner. For a given z-score, one knows the proportion of men and women at a given IQ level. Let us now take the case of Harvard Physics and Mathematics full professors. In the US, the average theoretical physics full professor has an IQ of 170, 170. At Harvard, this score would probably be more, like 190 since the real genii score a little over 200. An IQ score of 190 corresponds to a z-score, in other words the number of standard deviations, of 6 with a male standard deviation of 15 and an average IQ score of 100, that is z for male, for male, that'd be 190 minus 100 over 15, that's 6. The female standard deviation will be 10% less, that is 1.5 IQ points less equals 13.5. So for a female to score 190, her Z score would be Z female equals 190 minus 100 divided by 13.5 equals 6.67. When one plugs in these two Z scores into the male and female bell curve formulas, one sees that the proportion of females having a Z score of 6.67 is much smaller than the proportion of males having a Z score of 6.0. In fact, at each IQ score, and hence Z score, one can predict the proportion of men and women at that level, and then compare it with the proportion of men and women in jobs performing in the real world at that level. For example, one can compare the proportion of men and women getting a math PhD, or getting an assistant professorship in math, or a full professorship in math, or the Fields Medal, which is the Nobel Prize equivalent in mathematics. I guess maybe I wrote this before I heard about the Abel Prize. Uh, when was that first awarded? 2013? I'm not sure. The, the Abel Prize is like the Nobel Prize in math. It's awarded every year in about a million dollars. These theoretical proportions that are derived from the male and female variances in their bell curves match very closely the real world proportions. That's important. So we are talking about a very good quantitative theory, the kind that physicists and science like best. Three, political consequences. The same GMV phenomenon exists with other measurable quantities that are important to people in their daily lives, e.g. ambition, aggressiveness, curiosity, etc. So it's therefore not surprising that the top performers in any of these areas will be male. This is confirmed clearly if one consults a Who's Who book in the US. One will find that about 95% of the entries are male. 97% of the science Nobel Prizes have been won by males. 
fact, I think it's now like 99%. 95% of National Academies of Science members are male. 95% of the Presidents and Prime Ministers of countries are male. 95% of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are male. In fact, I think it's 98. Anyway, I could go on and on. It's clear that there's a lot of truth to the phrase that we live in a male-dominated world. Given this male-dominated reality, the feminists will have to come to terms with it, that is, accept it. If they don't believe, in it, don't believe it, then they can educate themselves. GMV is a broadly applicable phenomenon in the biological world, so the feminists can Google articles that they can read about the phenomenon and convince themselves. If they continue to push the urban myth that women are as genial, meaning genius-like genius IQs, as males, they risk being dismissed and ridiculed by science. In fact, female inferiority at the genius level is an example of a general social and cultural phenomenon. Throughout most of history, in most cultures, women have been looked upon by both sexes as inferior. In an agricultural society, the males were stronger and hence of greater value in the fields. In warrior cultures, the men were more aggressive and stronger and hence were more valued. In our modern science-based culture, intellectual brilliance is highly valued, and so, once again, women will just have to learn to accept their inferiority yet again. With the rise of the recent round of feminism in the 70s, the feminists were making claims that were true in general, but not at the genius end of the spectrum. Note that no one seems to care much that the utter morons are also males. Such males don't attract much, at much attention, but they do fill up the foster homes. A male moron is too stupid even to sweep the streets. Note also that the same matching of theoretical proportions of males to females at the very low end of the IQ range with the observed proportions in the real world is also excellent. So even in the modern world, men are dominant because the genii are males and genius is highly respected. Consider how valuable are the men who invent the transistor, the computer, the math, the nine symphonies, etc. The feminists may have a hard time accepting such negative truths, but if they don't, then they're going to annoy a lot of anti-PC males like myself, who despise having to listen to PC falsehoods that don't fit with scientifically verified realities. It offends my sense of intellectual honesty and conflicts with a lifetime of scientific learning. I can imagine that the GMV phenomenon may be crushing for the collective feminist ego, but that's too bad. GMV is the way of the world and as such will just have to be lumped for the, origin, the origins of GMV? Question mark. Where does GMV come from? The empirical fact of the matter is not in doubt. Ask any biologist. However, the theoretical underpinnings of the phenomenon are less secure. As far as I can tell from Googling, the most popular theory, and it does seem very plausible, is the following. The default embryogenic design is female. If there are no male genes to switch the basic female design to male, the embryo will be steered into a female pattern. Since the vast majority of the genes needed to build a human baby are female, the male chromosome need only be very small, containing only a few switching genes to divert the course of development from female to male. If you know a little genetics, you'll know that the human genome contains 46 chromosomes in each cell half from the mother and half from the father. There are 23 pairs of chromosomes, with each pair con containing a chromosome from the father and one from the mother, with both chromosomes of the pair responsible for the same set of protein building instructions. But only one, keeping things simple, of the pair gets used, that is, gets switched on to build the embryo and the baby. The chromosome of the pair that is switched on and the other switched off is called dominant and the chromosome of the pair that is switched off is called recessive. Evolution has selected the fitter, more favorable, genes to be dominant. The gen geneticists will tell you that there are many more types of recessive genes than dominant genes. This now has interesting consequences. The female chromosome is called the X chromosome, and the male chromosome is called the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome is by far the smallest of the 23, and the X chromosome is about average in size, with many genes on it. In other words, about, about a thousand. There are about 23,000 genes in the human genome. 
Uh, a female has two X chromosomes in her cells. A male has one X and one Y chromosome in his cells. Since the X chromosome is so much bigger than the Y chromosome, nearly all of the genes on the X chromosome in the cells of the male will be expressed, that is, used to build proteins, to build the baby. So with the male, all those recessive genes on his X chromosome will not be switched off by dominant genes in a second X chromosome the way there are in a female's cells for the simple reason that the male cells does not have a second X chromosome. So, over a whole population, the males will be expressing a greater variety of recessive X chromosome genes than the females. The females will have their recessive genes masked by, a, by the dominant genes on the other X chromosome, since the female cells have two X chromosomes. A greater variety of expressed recessive genes in the male cells results in a greater variance in the males of the population than in the females, hence GMV. Has any research been done to test this theory? I would appreciate hearing from experts on this matter so that I can update this essay with the material links they send me. My general view is that even if the above theory is in dispute, the empirical fact of GMV is not, and that is what really matters. 5. References It suggested that readers interested in reading more about the GMV phenomenon can Google using the key phrase, greater male variance. Some infor informative references I found on the internet can be found at these links. Uh, all one word, soberingthoughts.blogspot.com slash 2008 underscore 07 underscore 01 underscore archive or A-R-C-H-I-V-E dot HTML. The second reference is too long and tedious. Uh, have a look at the uh, the essay text uh, on my website. The second reference contained the following interesting table. The variance ratio was found to be the ratio of the male variance and the female variance. For math in US grade schools, this ratio was about 1.1. And then there's a, a table. And the variance ratio is about 1.1 in grade 2, in grade 3, in grade 4. Uh, in grades 5 and 6 it's 1.14, in grade 7 it's 1.16, in grade 8 it's 1.21, in grade 9 it's 1.14, in grade 10 it's 1.18, in grade 11 it's 1.17. You get the point, okay? Postscript. Calculating the proportion of females to males with elite IQs. The point of this portion of the essay is to calculate, given the two male and female IQ variances, actually standard deviations, where the variance is the square of the standard deviation, the proportion of males, females to males at elite IQ levels. I went hunting for the male, female and male IQ standard deviations and eventually found the following values, which I needed to begin my little piece of research. The link for these IQ standard deviations, male and female, was... Uh, the link is IQ comparison site, that's all one word, dot com slash sex differences, one word, capital S, capital D, dot ASPX. The female IQ standard deviation it gave was 13.55, and the male IQ standard deviation was 14.54. From these two standard deviations, it was a trivial matter to calculate the percentage difference. 14.54 minus 13.55 times 100 divided by 13.55 equals 7.3%. To find the variance percentage difference, the calculation was 14.54 squared minus 13.55 squared times 100 divided by 13.55 squared equals 15.15% which is quite a bit higher than the 10% mentioned above. I will work with this 7.3 standard deviation percentage difference, that is, the two standard deviations, male and female, in the calculations that follow. I will now calculate the proportion of females to males at very high IQ scores for a range of scores, and then compare the predicted theoretical proportions obtained from plugging in the standard deviations into the bell curve, Gaussian normal curve, formula of females to males at a given IQ score 
to the real-world proportions of females to males found at various professional levels in the intellectual world. For example, at PhD student level, at professor level, at Fields, Menor, Fields Medal winner level, etc. If the match is good between the theoretical prediction and the real world, then the theory has quantitative strength, the kind that mathematical physicists and scientists most favour. I will calculate the proportions, female to male, at elite IQ scores of 120, 130, 140, 150, 160, 170, 180, 190, 200. An IQ of 120 would probably be typical, this could be checked, of undergrad anthropology students. An IQ of 130 would probably be typical of undergrad math students. An IQ of 140 would probably be typical of master's math students. An IQ of 150 would probably be typical of math PhD students. An IQ of 170 would probably be typical of university math professors. I know that the average IQ of theoretical physics professors in the US is 170, with a standard deviation of 15. Math professors at US Ivy League universities would probably have IQs in the range 180s to 190s. Fields Medal winners probably have IQs around 200, the super genii. There have been no female Fields Medal winners ever. I think there was one recently. One. Methodology. I used the following link to find the Z score, that is the number of standard deviations above the mean, that is average IQ value of 100, assuming females and males have the same average IQ. In fact, IQ scores are constructed such that this is true. Uh, remember the proviso I made earlier about Professor Rushton's research. Uh, in reality, uh, men are smarter than women by about three or four IQ points on average. The internet link to the z-score calculator that I used was Daniel Soper, D-A-N-I-E-L-S-O-P-E-R, that's all one word, dot com slash statcalc, S-T-A-T-C-A-L-C-3, statcalc3, one word, slash calc, C-L-C, dot A-S-P-X, question mark, I-D equals 22. And the link to another site that I used to convert a z-score into a percentile was measuring usability, that's all one word, dot com slash pcalcz, so p-c-a-l-c-z dot php. This site allowed me to choose the number of decimal places, 15, in the percentile, which enabled me to find the percentile with great accuracy, which was needed with such large z scores. Actually, using tiny z scores was more convenient because it allowed me to calculate the male to female percentage proportions more conveniently due to the symmetry of the bell curve. Here are the z scores for the females with standard deviation of 13.55 for the various IQ levels. Uh, I'm not going to read them all, that would be too boring and dry. Um, if you want to see the actual details uh, for the z scores for females at various IQ scores, ranges, uh, go to have a look at the text of this essay in, that you can find, it, find on my website. Here are the z-scores for the males with standard deviation of 14.54 for the various IQ levels, and again a, a list. These z-scores were then converted into percentiles, that is the percentage of women scoring below that z-score, and again there's a whole list, females and males. I now calculate the percentage proportions of females to males, that is using the formula percent ILE underscore female slash 100 divided by percent ILE underscore female plus percent ILE underscore male. Percentiles. Male percentiles. So for IQ 120 uh, 8.4% have an IQ above 120. For 1.9% uh, have an IQ above 130. 0.3% have an IQ above 140. 
0.03 have an IQ above 150. 0.002 have an IQ above 160. And then, <laughs> then it gets into a different notation, exponential to minus 5. Have a look at the text of this essay uh, in my website if you want, if you really want to go to the nitty gritty. Female percentiles, uh, similar story, I'll skip over those. Uh, summed, summed percentiles, I'll skip over those. Percentage proportions, uh, I think I'll give those figures, they're the critical ones in the summary. Uh, to make these calculations I use the link calculate for free, that's all one word, dot com slash sci1 dot html. Summary. So, summarizing, the percentage proportions of females to males at the various IQ levels are shown below. Now, the critical term here is the, the percentage proportions, the proportions of females to males at the various IQ levels. So, at IQ 120, the proportion of females to males is 45%. Okay? So, people scoring 120 IQ or above, 45% uh, of them will be female. At 130, it's about 41% will be female. At 140, it'll be about 35% female, so about a third. At 150, 20, roughly 28% female. At 160, about 20% female. So about a fifth. At 170, 14% female. So what's that? About a sixth? Seventh? A seventh? About a seventh. Okay. At 180, 9% nine, 9 female. At 190, about 6% female. At, at 200, about 4% female. Analysis. Theoretical predictions. At IQ 120, so undergrad students, nearly half should be female. At 130, undergrad math students, about 40% should be female. At IQ 140, master's math students, about a third should be female. Now, from my own experience as a uh, math and physics and especially computer science professor at Chinese universities, about a third of my master's classes in computer science, especially computer theory, were female, about a third. So that fits, that's the, that's the reality, and it fits the theoretical prediction. Okay, at, at, and I'm, I'm giving the theoretical uh, proportions, right? At 150, so PhD math students, about a quarter should be female. At 160, hard science professors, about a fifth should be female. Mm, that, that, that sounds about right, if, if not less in, real, in the real world. 170 uh, math and physics profs, about a seventh should be female. At 180 Ivy League math profs, about a tenth should be female. At 190 Ivy League math profs, about 6% should be female. At 200 field medal winners, about 4% should be female. In fact, I think it should be even less than that. How well do these theoretical predictions match the real world? It seems to me that these theoretical predictions match the real world pretty well. At today's universities in many countries, the proportion of females in the, in the IQ ranges 120, 130 is about half. In my own experience in teaching master level computer science in China, about a third of my classes were female, as predicted. From my own experience as a prof, in one of the hard sciences, computer science, in my US computer science department, there were only two female profs. No female full profs out of a total of 15 professors. The fact that a seventh of the profs were female fits the theoretical prediction quite well. At the Ivy League level, the president of Harvard some years back remarked in a public speech that there were very few women in the math slash physics departments and that this may be due to a greater male variance, GMV. What he said fits the theoretical data. He should not have been criticized by the feminists because he was correct. 
The Fields Medal, which is equivalent to the Nobel Prize, but for mathematics, was first awarded in 1936 until the recent establishment of the Abel Prize in 2003, oh, not 2013, okay, which is now the real equivalent of the Nobel Prize for mathematics. There have been 52 winners so far, up to 2010. All have been male. That is reasonably consistent with the theoretical prediction that only about 4% of such winners should be female. And I think now we've had, we have one. Okay, criticisms. The above study is still rather crude. It could be tightened up with much better data. Psychologists slash sociologists could undertake studies to measure much more accurately the proportion of females to males at all performance levels and see how closely the theoretical predictions match the real world data. Perhaps such comprehensive studies have already